take an imaginary voyage on board the W.T. Preston, a stern-wheel, steam-powered snag boat located in Anacortes, Washington. Now a National Historic Landmark, she was hauled on dry land in 1983. This is an opportunity for you to view firsthand one of the only remaining intact vessels of her kind in existence. She resides next to the Anacortes Museum's Maritime Heritage Center. Join the museum's own guide, Dennis Mazza, as he takes you through the W.T. Preston. Welcome to the W.T. Preston. First, safety. No running. Watch your step as you go throughout the vessel. Thresholds. They are high throughout the boat. That means you'll have to step up and over as you go to various sections of the boat. Stairways, normally called ladders, are steep and narrow. Use the handrails. When you're ascending and descending, Take your time, watch your step. All right, now let me tell you a little bit about what the W.T. Preston did. This was called a snag boat. There was one, the Skagit, built in the 1800s, the Swinomish built in 1914. This one was built in 1939 and the only one that had a steel hull. The others lasted 10 or 11 years and they uh, rotted out, didn't last long. So this lasted from 1939 until 1981. Now, years ago, on the riverways, there was no other way to travel. There was no roads. Trees were in there. They had to chop the trees to get the lumber. They had to clear the fields for farming. A lot of that went into the water, which means a lot of the boats that they used for getting their goods out or for bringing people to Seattle or various waterways, they couldn't do. This is where the snag boat came in went from Blaine down to Olympia, had a crew of 14. Now down here in this area, which is the main cabin, here were the two firemen and the various deckhands that took care of all the machinery here. And a lot of this machinery is off to Swinomish from 1914. Proceed over here with me and let me show you how this boat actually operated. It was run by steam, it was run by diesel fuel, Years ago, it was run by crude oil, but in the 60s, the uh, EPA said, no, we want a cleaner fuel, so they went to diesel. But the engineer would stand here. Now, in the pilot house, all the captain had up there was the helm, these the telegraphs, compass, and some charts. And that was all. All the power came here from the engineer. He had to run everything. So when the captain would use the telegraph to use slow or standby, Engineer would acknowledge that by moving this and the captain would have that on his telegraph so he knew that the engineer acknowledged or they would use the voice tube right here. As the steam came through the pipe, the engineer would open this up, which is the throttle, and the steam would come into these two engines here on the starboard and port side. Let me explain how the engines work. The steam comes in from the steam pipe into this engine the exhaust goes out through this pipe right to the smokestack. The steam comes in. This is a 72-inch uh, stroke with the piston, 14 and a half inch bore. As it comes in here, this is attached to the pitman arm, which is attached to the crankshaft of the paddle wheel. Now, as this moves back and forth, there's a push and pull motion, and that's how both of these go this way, and that's how you get your paddle wheels going. Each one is on a 90 degrees on the port and starboard side. And as they go, that's what makes your movement. These engines here were off the Swinomish from 1914, and they were used right until 1981, being maintained by the crew members down here. Now, the eccentric arm here is connected to the crankshaft, and this here will adjust 
the steam coming into the cylinders here. There is a steam injector point that comes right here. It's a, it's a little tool that comes here. There's a little card, three by five card with a pencil, and it'll give you a graph of what's coming in here as far as if there's enough steam coming in, if it's a stop point, starting point, and that's what they use this for. Over here on the pitman arm, there is some leather tongs and an oil cup on each side. And as it slides along, it'll dip into the oil and that will lubricate the pitman arm. Proceed with me over here and let's go into the steering room. Now, the captain controls this at the helm in the pilot house. They have five rudders underneath the stern wheel. This is your steering apparatus right here, run by steam. And when he turns the wheel up above in the helm, that's the worm screw right here. That will stop at what angle that he wants the rudders at. And that's what this whole thing is. It does that. He controls it by the helm. Here is the engineer's tool room. And what's in here is a lot of the tools that they use aboard ship to make clamps, anything to help out the ship here, keep in ship shape. Now, some of these tools are 100 years old. They use these tools to make things here, because they did use blacksmithing, and that's part of it they left in here. Proceed with me over here to look at the steam generator. Now, this steam generator made electricity. This was DC power. They did put in the diesel generators. That was AC power. The AC, they needed that so they finally could get refrigerators in here, which they couldn't have before. Now here is a 1904 hand drill press. Now they did a lot of making tools. It was all hand drilled, 1904. And many people that come in here tell us that they have these in their barns. Now they know what they're used for. Follow me over here to the pumps. Now these pumps are off the Swinomish 1914. Now what this one here is, this is your boiler feed. You have 8,000 gallons of water down below in the bulkhead. That's when they push the pump on, that's what goes into the boiler. Then you have your, your various pumps here, wastewater. Uh, you have your fire pump over here, fresh water. This also could be used for pushing up the hazards with the pumps here. They put it down below the hazards, put the pressure up and that could build up and they could get the hazards out or they would use dynamite. Now this here is the telegraph that is out in the foredeck where the deck hands would use the telegraph to tell people here, okay, go what pressure they want. They would turn this and that would give the pressure over here so what they could use for on the foredeck. So that's what that was used for there. Proceed with me over here to this wonderful washing machine. Now this was used when they weren't near a town and they used this washing machine. Now it's called an easy washing machine. A lot of people come in and they say that they do still have an easy washing machine that their grandmother had. This is a very popular one. Many times they weren't near the town, this came in pretty handy for them. Let me give you a little information about the Preston's final journey. In 1981, the Preston retired. But in 1983, from the Dakota Creek ramp, Dakota Creek is pretty deep there and they can bring that in and that's what they did here. They put it on steel girders and that's what you see here now. You can get a lot of information from this board. The early years, snag boat operations, where it traveled from Blaine to Olympia. And here's all about the snag boats of which there were three that they had here. The original one from the Skagit from the 1800s. Then you had the Swinomish from 1914, and of course this snag boat here, the other team Preston. Life aboard the snag boat, that's very interesting. And there's the cook up here, which cooked all the meals here in all three of these boats for 40 years. And this is the Puget, which they use today to still pick up all the snags around 14 tons a day. This here is your donkey boiler. Now your donkey boiler used wood. They stored five cords of wood down below in the bulkhead. This was mainly used when the locomotive boiler, they had to clean out the tubes just like a locomotive. So when they did that, they had to shut down the boiler and use this uh, mainly to keep the generator going, the pumps going, the heat, and that's what they use this for. 
large pieces of wood were in here. And this is a water cock, just like you saw in the main boiler. And that will tell them if it's right down here, the water level comes down here, and there's steam that comes out, they got to fill it up right away. This is one of the workbenches that they use with the anvil. They did have some forging equipment. And this is some of the tools that they use right here. These are the tools that they use for making clamps. A lot of little things that went wrong on here, they had to fix by themselves. And that's what they used here. Right here, this shows all the information about all the workers that were on here from 1885 down to 1981. There was only seven captains since then. Some of them stayed on for 25 years. But an interesting note is that some of the ones that were deckhands or that were cabin boys became engineers or became captain if they passed the test. So they had an opportunity to do a lot of things in here as long as they passed everything and were able to be certified by the Army Corps of Engineers. This is the crew mess. This is for the crew on the main deck that worked down here, the firemen, the deck hands. They ate here. All their food came here down the dumbwaiter from the galley up above, from the cook. They took their meals, went to the table here, and when they're finished, they would put their dirty dishes here, and up it went, and the cook took care of the washing and whatnot. This is your crew quarters that are for the deck hands that worked on the main deck. There are two, four, six, eight of them located on the starboard and port side. They all thought that this was pretty comfortable living in here. This is your main boiler operated by diesel fuel and they had 149 tubes. If you look into the mirror here, you can see they'll show some of the tubes that are in here. Tubes uh, took care of the combustion that was in the tubes that went out to the smokestack. Also here, it did get to be about 379 degrees Fahrenheit. It was very hot heat that they had here. This hole right here, this is where the engineer or one of the crew members had to go in every so often when they shut the boiler down to check out if there's any cracks, or if there's anything in there that would hurt the boiler. So this is what happened right in this area right here. Let's go out to the uh, crane and the engine operation. Watch your foot here, it's a high step. This here is your crane turntable engine. This was built in 1914 by the Washington Iron Works. And this is your cable right here. Cable is around the crane turntable. It can turn in any direction and put your debris and lumber and navigational hazards on the side of the bank or on the barge. Now the hoist engine controls the winches and the spuds, as you, I'll mention the spuds as we get uh, further on. The uh, crane operator sits right here. He controls all the operations here with the brake levers and pulleys and whatnot. This is what he does, control it and make sure that everything is safe. Let's take a look at the uh, crane operation and watch your step here. This crane is 70 feet high and it can pick up 30 tons and 15 tons dredging. It did a lot of dredging on the banks. A lot of the banks caved in from floods, high uh, rains, and uh, this would dredge. It also dredged down at the, um, at the Chittenden Creek down there. That's what they, they did a lot of dredging because the boats could not pass through. So it did 15 tons of dredging, which was a lot for those days. Over here is what they call a spud. Now this spud right here is a anchor. We have one fore and one aft. They would drop that down by gravity, pick that up by steam. That is the only way that this could be stable when they're picking up navigational hazards. They used to use the anchor, but the currents were too strong and they weren't able to use the anchor. They could put the navigational hazards on the side. Years ago, they used to be able to burn that, but then EPA said no, they couldn't. Then they also had a barge. They would put all the, the hazards and whatnot on the barge, push that barge to a certain location where it was delivered to various areas. Also, they had two boats right here where they were able to put in the water and go out and get hazards, branches sticking up. That's what this whole area was used for. All right. 
Next, we're going to go up to the starboard ladder here. We're going to go up to the cabin deck, take a left, and go into the social room. Okay, this is the social room, but first of all, I'd like to point out this here. This is a registered National Historic Place, placed on the National Register on March 16, 1972, and by the National Park Service. This also was used as a for visitors, where they can stay here and watch the operation, but not get involved so they don't get hurt. So they stayed here. This also was used for their trophies, which they had many, for safety, or one of the races that they won, and that's what they had here. Now what we'll do is we'll follow through here, and you can see the officer's quarters. This here is the captain's room. He has his own shower and head here, and over here you have your engineer and your first mate. They share their showers and the head, but the rest of the crew, they have their showers located in the foredeck here. They share their head and their showers. This is the officer's mess, and this is where they ate their uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right here. And then over this way is the galley. And I'll explain some things that went on in the galley here. You have a, a stove that used diesel fuel, and it took 30 minutes for that to get started. So they had to plan their meals. Cooks work very hard here, get their meals, three square meals a day, right here. Now, you had a refrigerator, but that was run by DC, so they had a motor down below for that. But in the 60s, they did come up with the generators that were down below. That gave them AC power. So they were able to get two Kinmore refrigerators located right here on the two sides here. Now also, this is the, where the dumbwaiter was, where they put the food down for the crew down below, and that's where they got their food, and dumbwaiter was located here also. Okay, just a little word about the cook, Fritz, who was on all three of these ships for 40 years. He worked very hard making the meals. Uh, an interesting story that was brought up was that he made cookies, and he made them uh, especially hard. And then when the children were lined up on the side of the banks, he would throw out the cookies to them as they went along. Over here is your spud, just like on the foredeck. This is the aft, and that was used also for holding the pressed it in place so they can get the hazards out. Over here is an auxiliary wheel. This is connected to the five rudders down below. This was used in case there was some problem with the steering. They would use this here as an auxiliary. This is the splash guard here and below that is your paddle wheel. Now there was an 18-foot board shaft that was off the 1914 Swinomish. The cylinder is 70 feet in diameter. That was also from the Swinomish. There were 48 paddles. They were staggered so they would not get all the force in one place and also they wouldn't get any of the vibrations. They were uh, done that way. Stern wheel also had to be just the right position in the water. So when they went reverse, they had to uh, have the paddles uh, set just the right depth and also the, the rudders. Follow me to the pilot house. Watch your step and watch your head on this right here. This is the uh, pilot house. This is where the captain does all his operations right from here. Let me explain right here. This is the helm. This is the steering that is controlled by the five rudders down below. He has a compass right here and he has a chart. And that's the only thing he had here Except in the 70s, he did get a single sideband radio that was in here. Now, these are your telegraphs, and these were used for giving information to the engineer. This here is your voice tube that goes down to the engineer to give information commands to him. This is the voice tube that goes to the crane operator and the winchman there. Constant conversation with him. The uh, captain very rarely leaves this station here. He has to control everything right from here. Now, up here you have your cranks that are for the two uh, spotlights that are located on top of here. Right here you have a line that's connected 
to a bell. Now, when they pull this, the bell rings. This was a bell that was off the Swinomish from 1914. And let me give you a little example of how that sounds. Remember that the Preston is a very special artifact designed for a specific job and reflecting 150 years of local learning and development. When visiting a board, please look carefully at the details that make her unique and also give thought to the human heritage represented. There are notes placed throughout the ship which correspond with the written material you have in your hands. Take your time and enjoy your visit to this memorial to the glorious days of Puget Sound's working steam paddle wheel snag boats. Please sign our guest book before you depart and remember to tell your friends about your exciting visit and encourage them to come and see the ship for themselves. Fritz Friedberg cooked on snag boats for 40 of his years To feed the crews on Puget Sound for the Corps of Engineers He was cooking on the Skagit, the first of snag boats made Made to clear the channels for the river steamer trade Fritz was a good man, he cooked up hearty meals Three squares for snagging for steam and paddle wheels he transferred to the Swinomish when the Skagit was retired And from a wood-burning iron range to a new one oil-fired Fritz stood maybe five foot tall with feet flat on the floor But Fritz stood ten feet tall inside his galley door Fritz was a good man, he cooked up hearty meals Three shears were cooking on the steam and paddle wheels